Hello, uh, my name is Cheryl Trent. I am the owner of S Brand Consulting, which is a small firm based in Fort Collins, Colorado, and we specialize in facilitation. And most of our meetings are around strategic planning, um, and we do a lot of board development, teamwork, and community engagement. So thank you very much for having me. Well, thanks, I'm excited to be able to talk to you today. And I um, really want to hear how COVID has changed how you've delivered your products and your services and your business over the last few months. Well, I can tell you it's interesting perspective to bring to the table since most of my clients are in the public sector. So local governments, cities and counties, maybe some chambers, economic development corporations and quasi governments like special districts and some nonprofits. But in the past, the majority of my work in facilitation um, was done face to face. Of course, we do interviews beforehand and we would do a lot of work on the phone. But when we actually conducted a meeting, the best way to do these meetings is face to face. Based on all of the government regulations, our business literally shut down for the last almost three months. Um, people didn't stop doing strategic planning. They just stopped doing any public meetings or team meetings or retreats around strategic planning. It's starting to pick up now that we're in June and I expect to see um, it continue to pick up through June, July and the rest of the year but it certainly brought just a screeching halt to our business. So were your clients actively engaging in strategic planning, but just not doing the public component? That's a great question. The answer is for the most part, yes. Um, some of my clients are repeat clients. And so I know they're actively engaged in strategic planning from the standpoint of they're continuing to move forward with their strategic plans. They were continuing to implement because some of the work of public government never goes away, even if there's a massive crisis, whether it's a fire or a tornado. Um, you, you take care of the sort of instant crisis need, and then you go back slowly but surely to the operations of government that happen on a regular basis. Um, so I do know that they were actively continuing strategic planning, and even my brand new client. We were continuing to meet weekly by phone or by Zoom and talk about some of those finer details. Um, interview, continue to interview people, continue to engage on social media, continue to ask for opinions and feedback. Um, I will say one of the reasons I think that's a great question is that I think most of my clients realized they were missing a component of their strategic plans. Um, and that component we lose the term it resiliency, and I call it the zombie apocalypse plan because you just don't know what might happen. There, obviously, there was no way to predict this virus, just like there's no way to predict a flood or a tornado. But the virus is a little bit different in that it affected us globally. It affected us all in the same way, not equally, but in the same way. You know, we're not allowed to meet face to face. There was a lot of quarantining. Um, many uh, events completely shut down. Um, public engagement in terms of being able to go in and pay your bill or go to a council meeting completely shut down. Um, how do you plan for that? You know, let me give a worst case scenario from my perspective, especially we're using the internet right now to talk. What if there was no internet? How do you plan ahead for something like that? So that type of conversation around resiliency planning is now something my clients are pivoting more toward and having those conversations. Have you seen specific groups though now be left out of the conversation and the discussion? Another great question. Um, we all know that engaging with your community, whether you're a nonprofit, whether you're a government, whether you're even a a private group that has customers can be really difficult. Um, people don't want to go to meetings. They come home at the end of a long day and they're working with their family and they're trying to do chores and get dinner on the table and watch some Netflix. The last thing they want to do is go to a meeting. Um, so, you know, we've been playing around with some really 
interesting innovative community engagement ideas but when you go virtual you definitely leave some people out um and in my opinion those are the people who really do their best uh when they're engaging with other people and we're also i think missing out on a large portion of the population that doesn't play on facebook that doesn't play on um, instagram and those are interestingly not the two ends. For me, there's the one end that could potentially be an older generation that just doesn't like to engage in that kind of social media. But I will also say what I consider a much younger generation, say the 20 year olds and younger, they've moved on to forms of social media that we haven't caught up with yet, like TikTok, for example, and things I don't even know about. And um, my nephews and my friends who are younger and in that age category are consistently saying, oh no, I'm not on Facebook. Oh no, I, I left Instagram years ago. I'm thinking there's something else. So this in this virtual space, I think we really are missing out. The other thing I think we're missing out on is the ability to truly have a really good good and take. Because right now, virtually, you can interrupt me. I mean, if I was, which I am going on too long, right? But if I'm going on too long, you could wave your hands at me or you could verbally interrupt. But that's very different than sitting at a table with you and having a give and take conversation. So I see that as a, being a big gap. How do you think these local governments will be able to move forward with all the restrictions, but yet at the same time, what are they gonna learn from that? You said they're, they're still continuing to move government forward. They're getting less voice and impact, but boy, we're getting a lot of something from the riots. How does that factor into where your where you think your clients are going and i don't know if that that was a good question but lots lots going on i mean they want to still move forward they're getting different types of input now they are getting different types of input and what i found most interesting and this is anecdotal at this point but i think this will prove to be true in the long run most of my clients have said they are just shocked by attendance virtually at their public meetings. It's still hard to get input, um, even through our normal channels of social media and, and websites. And But they say that when they're live streaming their meetings, the people online with them during those meetings have grown far beyond anybody who grew up in a personal town hall, council meeting situation, which I find interesting. Um, I think it's a really easy way for people to sit around in their pajamas at home, eating at home, almost like, you know, this virtual um, opportunity to just hang out and listen, and then you can go away if you want to. Um, it's not like you're standing up and disrupting a meeting to leave in the middle of it. So that's one thing. My clients, I think, are finding that virtual approach really, really works well for some people. They can come and go as they please, super easy. The other thing I'm seeing is that local governments are distinctly pivoting in the nature of the services that their community finds important. So you came around to what's going on right now, this week particularly, and that is the protests and the riots that have been going on throughout the country. Um, I don't have any feedback from my clients on how that's affecting them other than the, the resource and the capacity issue. Um, I do know that this issue of resiliency requires a much better community relationship than many of us in our respective communities currently have. A much better level of connection, um, knowing who people are, in these wide range of resources that are available across the spectrum of our communities, knowing who to contact, and in fact, having a personal relationship with them that's deep enough to understand what they do, who they serve, and what their resources are to be able to tap into in the event something happens. Um, 
you know, society as a whole has a lot of flaws and gaps and horrific things that happen to people. But I also think that that type of conversation within the community that's necessary um, can really go a long way to bridge some of those misunderstandings and hopefully start this process of offering these across the board equitable approaches to the way we provide services, to the way we deal with people, um, to the way government interacts with the people that we work for. So historically, people had to go to government to get services. You had to physically go there, submit papers. Under this whole new COVID experience, it sounds like I'm hearing you say, government is finally realizing that they have to go to people. And are you seeing, are you seeing that recognition? And if so, are you seeing it being developed into how do we transition? Yes, um, and I, I'm seeing three things that I think are really great changes that people are starting to make a commitment to in local government. Um, the first, as you mentioned, is this opportunity for people to interact in ways that might be awkward or uncomfortable because you're just not used to them. And that is this virtual world. Um, I still have clients who in the past, say six or eight months ago, were uncomfortable using social media as to gather feedback and input. Um, they felt it was a little too loose. They felt that people could say anything they wanted to say um, and that they wouldn't be able to adequately respond. But those are issues that have been addressed and solved very, very um, completely by many governments across the nation and across the world, as a matter of fact. So yes, I definitely see people pitching. Um, they're saying we will continue to hold meetings by uh, whatever platform we're using, Zoom, GoToMeeting, there's lots of them out there. We'll continue to have team meetings, you know, internal meetings that allow this virtual um, input and this virtual capacity. Um, I'm seeing the services that we do, while again, I firmly believe face-to-face -face is the best way to develop a relationship, and develop communication, to really get to the heart of some critical, critical issues. Um, there are lots of ways to gather that input before we have to have that kind of a meeting. The second way I've seen pivot in a way that I'm just so excited about is working from home. Now we all know there are some people who are great at working from home, wanted to do it for a long time. Um, they have all the necessary attributes, skill sets, and um, abilities to make working from home super effective, efficient. But government for a long time was just welded to this idea of oh, you have to come in to work to be effective, which is simply not true. Um, so now that we've been forced to do it for some months, um, there are a lot of people out there and a lot of governments just locally here in Colorado that have already said, okay, you know, X percent of, of our workforce will be working from home, or all non-essential employees will be working from home except for one day a week, or we're going to a four-day work week, or all sorts of those things that government was so reluctant to do because they felt it hurt public service. Simply not true. And then the third thing I find exciting is there always were these platforms available for this virtual interaction. Um, and there are thousands of them. Um, one I really like, by the way, is a virtual platform for commenting on things that you and I used to do in our previous lives, community uh, development plans, maps, um, park plans, master plans, economic development and downtown plans. And they figured out a way to build a platform that's super interactive. You know, yep, you, you can put it virtually put a dot where you can virtually write something down, scribble it down onto this map. Um, it's just, you can move it around on the map and see what it looks like and it changes all the statistics and the data. And you can do all that from the comfort of your home. So I think making it easy for people to interact, the light bulb has gone off that these virtual platforms are a great way to make it easier for people to interact. So we're gonna get better results. Do you think that 
your clients and the general government workers that you're engaging with, how are they doing? On the whole, um, I have to say I saw, you know, all of those stages. First of all, when you work in local government and you have a crisis, you are on it. I mean, you engage 187%. Every resource you have, every person you have, you, you turn them toward addressing and trying to solve that problem. Um, it was made more difficult because almost immediately we figured out that we couldn't do that next to each other at a desk like we would normally. So um, then there's that stage of, oh my gosh, this is going to be around a long time. That sort of shock and awe of this isn't a three week crisis anymore. This is now a 30 year crisis. Um, then that next stage I saw was what are the, I call them unanticipated consequences. Will we really lose revenue and how do we figure out if we're going to lose revenue? What employees can work from home and is that going to be effective or non-effective? How do I deal with my council? members who don't have laptops, um, how can we get them to virtually? What kind of resources and technology do we need to get to make this happen? And what I'm seeing now is this sort of expanded consciousness of, okay, clearly, um, we always knew we were reliant on our relationship with our community, but now even more so, we're reliant. Um, local government is inherently limited. We're limited in the work that we do, the reach that we have, the authority that we have. And so for my clients to say, this picture is so much better. Um, in order for our community to emerge on the other side of this at some point healthier and better, then we have to expand our view of not only what's possible, but maybe even the traditional role of government. Maybe the traditional role of local government should be to um, open up healthcare centers. In some communities, that's absolutely true. In some communities, they're offering their own mini grants or loans to their own businesses separate from anything the federal or the state government might do. Um, so they're doing things that are outside their comfort zone and they're trying things that I'm so proud of them for trying because you won't know it works until you try it. So right now I can say that there's a lot of optimism and you probably know I work across the nation. So some of my clients literally have not been affected at all. They don't have um, deaths in their community, thank goodness, their revenue hasn't been affected. And then I have communities I work with who are likely gonna lose 20 to 25% of their income. What I see in the future moving forward is this is gonna force the issue of local government revenue and what that looks like. It's also going to force the issue of being so heavily dependent on only two forms, property tax and sales tax. And I know some communities get income tax across the nation, so you can throw that in there. But even those three forms of, of income are no longer traditionally relevant or stable in this new possibility of this zombie apocalypse. So... tell our grandkids in the future, which we don't have, how do we, how do we explain to them that in many situations we had the federal government telling us what was safe, we had the state government, then we had county government and municipal government all there together telling different stories. Who are we supposed to believe? I think that you've just hit a, a fascinating aspect of people who are really trying to give us the best information they have based on the data that they have at hand. Um, and I think you're seeing this larger issue play out. And for me, this larger issue is sound bites, a three minute video, some post from somebody you don't know who claims to be a doctor. 
and they say something which gets repeated and repeated and repeated and if you repeat it often enough it becomes true so i am hoping one of the outcomes of this is that people understand and realize that they truly do need to make decisions for themselves decisions that are not just in their best interest but in the best interest of both themselves their family and uh, ultimately the community at large um you know you talked about the easiest thing to talk about is probably masks should you wear a mask or not wear a mask well we're required to wear a mask that's the state requirement and the federal requirement in many cases and in my own city that's a requirement for most of the businesses that are open that i'm supposed to wear a mask and yet some of the leading experts in the nation say wearing a mask isn't going to do a darn thing for you so I hope it brings us full circle. And what I'd tell my grandkids, and you're right, we don't have them yet, but maybe someday, um, is, you know, make up your own mind. Read first. Do read first. Look up multiple opinions. Read the people that you don't agree with, as well as the people that you might agree with, and then make the best decision. But there's no reason to violate a rule or a law, even if you think it's silly, as long as it's not harming you and harming anyone else. Wear your mask. There's no reason not to. If you don't want to, that's no problem. Just don't go into a store that requires you to wear a mask. So I'm hoping it causes our grandchildren to think more critically and more deeply about some of these issues, not just COVID, but all of these issues that go on in the world. And to really make a decision that's not focused on themselves, but focused on this bigger picture of the work that they've done. How will this experience change you, not only as a professional, but as a citizen? Well, I think that um, I am lucky to be healthy. My husband is in that category. He's around here somewhere, don't tell him I said this, of both age and health, that he's in an extremely high risk category. and. So for me, the way it changed me personally was um, in three ways. The first is it really shone the light on people who deeply depend on their daily face-to-face -face interactions with their family and friends. Those people really figured out. Those are the people who can't wait to get back to a work environment where there are other people. Those are my neighbors who, um, you know, come right within six feet and tell me about their day where we used to be able to sit on the porch, but they really need that attention. And I want to make sure that I recognize that personally and, um, you know, bring out more of that myself. I tend to be an introvert. I'm perfectly happy a porch or two or eight away waving at people. Um, secondarily, the health of my husband, as I mentioned, has caused me to be a lot more careful than I would normally be, um, to wash my hands a lot more than I would normally, to go that sort of crazy, like above and beyond with the groceries that you see the guy in the video do where he washes everything and sets it on a separate counter. And, and then the third thing I think is to have this respect for people's differences and the way they've chosen to approach this. Um, you know, the respect for the people who don't want to wear a mask, um, I can choose not to hang out with them if that's important to me. I can choose um, not to go into an establishment if I don't want to wear a mask. I can choose not to eat in a restaurant if I don't want to eat in a restaurant. This issue of personal choice and, you know, not allowing somebody to necessarily dictate my actions um because they think i should or shouldn't be doing something cheryl it's crazy to wash all your groceries well it may be crazy but it makes me feel better. so i'm going to continue to wash my groceries so let's be more accepting of the differences that we have as opposed to calling each other out because of the differences that we have now professionally um i've always worked virtually i've always offered my clients the virtual options um, I have found that most of them are willing and want to wait until we can meet again in person because they also believe in the value of face-to-face -face interactions. 
So I believe there's a solid place and people are now realizing there's a solid place for this virtual facilitation, virtual planning, virtual conversations. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Workplace absolutely yep. believes is an alternative, um, but I think it's also for the fact that there's really nothing like this level of human interaction and quality that you get from sitting down in a room and talking to you like this instead of being virtual. You read a lot. You work with multiple communities. We hear all kinds of stuff on the, the news. What are you most concerned about? <clears throat> I'll say that I have not seen the interaction with my clients, even when I expected it in a meeting. But this is what I'm most concerned about that people walk into a room or into a discussion having made up their mind prior and be completely not only unwilling to have a conversation about it in a way that's respectful and professional but to go so far as to be uh, personally demeaning or to go on the attack or to you know, deride someone else's opinion um, simply because they don't agree with each other. And again, I haven't seen that in my clients, but I, I, I feel that on social media. I feel that a lot in, in situations like we're going through in the last couple of weeks with, um, you know, accusations of police brutality, um, accusations of, you know, this racial inequity. And I don't use the word accusations in any way to suggest that that's not reality. But what I see is people picking a side and thinking that they have to be all on that side, as opposed to being able to pick a side and say, you have a point there. I understand your point, I agree or disagree with your point, but I'm still squarely in this corner. Um, you know. Not all cops are bad cops. Not all cops are racist cops. Not all black people are criminals. Not all black people should be on a t-shirt. So I think that's what I'm most afraid of is this big divide that eventually we can't bridge that gap. And then where are we? Far worse off than we are today. Well. How is this going to end? We have communities that are currently and have been burning for the last week or so. We have public places across the nation that have been defaced and broken. All the while, while our communities don't have the revenue that they had to take care of the normal things. Who's going to take care of this? For me, it all comes back full circle to this concept of relationships. And keeping in mind that I quit watching the news about five years ago. Um, I didn't feel as if the news was providing a benefit to the way I approached my life. It wasn't educating me in a way that I felt was um, helpful and meaningful. So I have a tendency to understand that on the news is a capture of a moment or moments in time, that it can never tell the whole story, um, and that I need to keep that in mind. Otherwise, I would walk through life uh, angry, depressed, upset, emotional, sick, with a headache. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I could get out of bed every morning, right? And I know that's what a large part of our, our country is feeling right now. Um, if you've been persecuted and abused and um, discriminated against and um, faced, you know, unwanted and unlawful harassment and discrimination your entire life, that, that's how you get up every morning. But 
it comes back the full circle to the community. There are many people in those same communities that you mentioned that are willing to get together and help rebuild, that are willing to get together and clean up, that are willing to get together and, you know, wash off graffiti, that are willing to get together and have communication and relationships and talk about the issues that are causing the, the, the problems and start to solve some of those problems within their own communities. Um, and by community, to me, that could be a neighborhood, it could be a business district, it could be an entire city. Um, I'm not trying to limit community to people or a race or you know a certain segment. But to me, that's what what's going to have to happen. It, those communities are going to have to come together and figure out a way to help themselves because you can't depend on the state to do this. You can't depend on the federal government to do this. If we could, it would have been done in the 1950s. And we wouldn't be having this conversation, you know, 40 years later, 50 years later. Um, that's what I think. That's my, that's my opinion. <laughs> so what are you doing in the midst of all of this to stay healthy? Well, again, I don't watch the news. That would be number one. Number one. I have to say that we have a dog and I do believe animals help greatly reduce the stress. And they also, in the case of the dog and the cat too, believe it or not, we go on walks with both the dog and the cat. So that gets us outside in the fresh air. Um, I have a strong family connection. And so we were getting together by Zoom once a week. And we've kind of limited that now. We're at once a month on Zoom, but I talk to my family several times during the week. Um, I do have strong friend connections as well. And while we can't get together in person, we often talk on the phone. I'd like to tell you I work out and that would not be true. And I'd like to tell you I eat well and I'm given that like a 65% positive rating. Okay, here's my last question. Um, and then I'll ask you, kind of wrap it up for us. What do you think you have learned from this? Have you had any aha moments about yourself? Good or bad, things you didn't know, something you want to share with us. So it's an interesting coincidence, it really is a coincidence, that I'm in the, literally in the middle of a course from Cornell on uh, diversity, bias, and inclusion. And so the course has been very eye-opening for me, and especially in the midst of some very, um, you know, horrifying real-life examples. And I have to say that this concept of white privilege, which I knew, I read about, logically knew, is starting to sink home in a different way uh, because of this class from Cornell, but also because of these sort of real life examples. It's pretty easy yeah. in a place like I do um, to separate yourself from that. Oh, that's some other city. Oh, that's some other state. Um, even if it is closer, say Denver, oh, that's just down in Denver. Um, and to allow yourself to kind of be surrounded by this soft white marshmallow of your white privilege. So, that's really brought it home for me a little bit how privileged I truly am and I'm very 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 grateful for that privilege and I understand clearly it's simply because of well, well what luck or divine influence or whatever you want to call it I mean I didn't get to pick where I was born or who I was born to or what color my skin was um and now I'm I'm having to think about how I walk through the world in a different way in the sense of what can I do to positively affect the situation in a way that's meaningful, um, respectful, and, and has some level of impact that's more than just, say, sending a, a donation off to a particular organization. Now, as far as the COVID thing, um, I think I've realized how much I prefer not being on video. I mean, I'm laughing about that but it's true i've had so many zoom meetings in months than i ever had before and i i've used zoom for years but i always feel like i need to you know make my back 
my fake background so clean. I feel like I need to, you know, take a shower and put on some nice clothes. Whereas before, if I was on the phone with you, Monica, I'd be like, oh, hey, how's it going? I'd be multitasking. I would be, you know, drinking my cock, whatever. So I think that sort of surprised me that I don't like being on video as much as we have been. So anything else you want to memorialize in your thoughts and your experiences through, through COVID? I'd say this. I'd say that I firmly believed before and I firmly believe now that the vast majority of people we will ever come in contact with are good, decent people who have their community's best interests at heart. Sometimes the expression of that does not, is not positive. Sometimes the expression of that causes damage. But that doesn't mean that those people are somehow inherently evil. That doesn't mean I'm evil because I made a mistake, um, because I didn't understand where you were coming from. Um, or because I'm inherently ignorant, but I'm not evil. Um, and I still believe that, which to me leads to my closing statement, which is I have this immense amount of positivity about our communities moving forward. Every time I've seen um, some opportunity to be better, to be more resilient, to be better at what we do, to be more effective and more efficient, I've seen cities and cities and nonprofits take that opportunity and run with it. Um, it's hard work, um, but if you were around 2008, that was a significant downturn in the economy, and the recovery pattern from that, I think, um, is something that we can look back on and be proud of, and you know, weave that into the fabric moving forward. I have high positivity moving forward. <laughs>